You've probably seen generics before because TypeScript is not the first language to have them. Lots of languages do, but TypeScript I think brings some unique things to the table. So let's take a look at generics in TypeScript in this video. My one liner on generics is that generics allow you to wrap functionality around other types. And there are two main examples that you likely have used, arrays and promises. At the top here, you can see we've got A1 and A2, which are both arrays. First is an array of strings, and second, we have an array of numbers. Now we're being explicit about the types here, saying this is an array of type string and an array of type number. But even if we pulled these out, I'll take this out for number, for example, you can see that A2 still is properly inferred as a number array. Now arrays are kind of a special generic in that there's two ways to represent them in the type system. We could do the array and then the angle brackets. Angle brackets are the typical generic syntax. So in this case, we're saying an array of strings or with an array, we could also say number or whatever the type in the inside the array is. And then we can put our uh, square brackets after that. Now, the thing to take away here though, is that the array in both the case of an array of strings and an array of numbers is always the same. That is, you have the same interface, the same functions on the array that you can operate on. So for example, in X and Y here, you see we're popping from A1 and A2. X returns a string or undefined. Y returns a number or undefined. And so X and Y are strongly typed with whatever type is in the array, but the interface that we call pop in both cases is exactly the same. We have a common set of functionality wrapping some other type inside. And it doesn't really matter what you put into the array. It's a envelope or a wrapper that can contain any other type. The same is true about promises. We've got two promises that we're creating here. And again, we have a string and a number inside of them. In this case, we're not being explicit about the types, but we can see that TypeScript can correctly infer these. So P1 is a promise of string and P2 is a promise of number. We have the same interface, if you will, again, that we can operate on. So we can do await P1 and await P2, even though they're promises of different types, we can still await both of them. X, of course, is going to be a string and Y, of course, is going to be a number. Again, we can unwrap that promise and pull out the value inside. It doesn't matter what the value is. So these are two built-in types, array and promise, that you probably use pretty regularly and that both are generics. But let's look at what it means to create our own generics. I'm going to paste in an example here and we can walk through this. So the example here is that we have jobs that we want to run and we probably want to put them on a queue and then we want to uh, be alerted when those jobs are complete. So we have this type here, which is a job run. Right. This is a single run of a type of job. We can have a job that for now we're just going to say is of type any. And then the job run has three different states, queued, running, or completed. And finally, we have an incomplete callback that we can register and we will know when the job is complete. Notice that the callback takes an argument job, which again is a type of any. So this is the way that you might make a job run type without using generics. We don't know what type of job we need to run. And so we're just going to set it to any, and we can't really strongly type that because we don't know. And now finally, we can get our job run instance by enqueuing the job in a queue. So we have enqueue job here. It takes some job again, because we're trying to support any possible type of job in the system. We just have to say any, we're going to have some logic to queue it up there and then we'll return our new job run. So we have that job instance, we have the job state is queued, and then we have an incomplete hook where we could register a callback. Here's an instance J of our send email job, and then we can enqueue it. And now we have this run here, which is a job run instance. And finally, we're going to call our oncomplete handler. And now notice that we have this job argument and the type, of course, is any. That was kind of a lot of setup. But the point here is that we have this idea of a job run. We want to know when the job is complete, but we want to be able to support any type of job. In this case, we're not using generics. And so we have to fall back on the any type, which is not a great type to use in TypeScript. If I say job dot, well, I can't get any kind of autocomplete support here because TypeScript only knows that job is any. It doesn't know specifically that it is a send email job. So what could we do to convert job run here to something that uses a generic to allow us to have strong types throughout our system? Well, what we can do is say job run here takes some job type J. And I think about this in two ways. When you have the angle brackets here with a type inside of it, first, you can think of it like a function. When you have a function, you can pass it an argument and that argument affects the outcome. In this case, the argument is our type J, which job run takes. 
and the outcome that is affected is that we have a job run of a particular type J. We can actually change the return to type of job run by assigning different values to J. The other way to think about this is like a template, right? So J here is some template value that is going to be replaced dynamically when we use it with some real value. In fact, other languages like C++ and maybe other languages actually call generic types template types. So that's another mental model I like when it comes to generics. But now that we're taking this J argument here, what can we do with that? Well, we can say that we expect job to be of type J, and then we expect the argument to our callback here to also be of type J. So now if we create a job run type of a particular job, we can know that the job property on the job run will be of that type and we can know that our callback will be of that type as well. Okay, so once we make this change to job run, we can now see that we actually have an error further down here. And that is that generic type job run requires one type argument. We need to actually assign a type argument here. What value do we want to put in there? Well, essentially we want to take whatever the type of this job right here is. And so what we want to do here is add a generic parameter to our in queue job function. And the way we do that is with the same angle bracket syntax and we put it after the function name. And here I'm gonna add the type J. Now it doesn't have to be the same as the type we did before. So maybe I'll make it T um, just to show you that it can be different. So this just tells TypeScript that in queue job is going to use some type T somewhere in this function. And the place we're gonna use it is to replace this any right here. This tells us that the job is gonna be of type T. Now again, it's, it's kind of an any in that we could put any type in here. It doesn't really matter because we're not limiting it at all. We'll get to that in a second. But essentially it gives us a way to hook into whatever that type is. Whatever the type of the argument to enqueue job is, now we have a type that represents it. And so now I can put that in our angle brackets here at the end. So I'll put my T in there. All right. And now finally, let's replace this last any down here with a T as well. So now we have a function that returns a job run of T. One thing you'll notice is that when I set this T in here, we did not have a type error on line 15 here. And that's because type job here is of type T already. And so it matches, as we set up here, the type J that is being passed into our job run type. We ensure that those are going to be the same. If, for example, we made this something else, for example, T of string, then we can see that this would throw an error because it says type T is not assignable to type string. So that's why this knows that this is still successfully returning the correct type. Okay, so now that we have that in place, is there anything else we need to change? Actually, there's not. If we scroll down to the bottom here, our oncomplete function, you can see that the type of the job argument is now the send email job, which is exactly the type of job that we passed into in queue job. If we were to try to use some autocomplete on job here, you can see that I have recipient email and subject accessible to me, and that these can now be strong typed. And so now we successfully have a generic type that allows us to manage different types of jobs. And it gives us a wrapper for managing those jobs that doesn't really care about what the job is, but we can use the same in queuing functionality and on complete callback. And we get strong typing for the job within our wrapper. Now we can go a step further with this because here's something else that could be happening. Let's say we just passed in a simple string here to enqueue job like this. Right now there's nothing that prevents us from doing this. And of course we no longer have a subject on that, so I'll delete that. But now you can see that our job parameter here is just a string. And maybe that's not so useful for our system. Maybe there's like some base functionality that we expect all jobs to have. Maybe, for example, up at the top here, I can paste in a job type. And this is what a basic job should have. It should have a name, it should have a function that we can call to start the job, and it should have a state. Maybe that's incomplete or success or failure. And so now we say that any job should have at least these properties. And so for a job run to actually work, it needs a job that has those properties on it. So what we can do is instead of just saying J inside our angle brackets here, we can say that J extends job. So what this is saying is that job run will now wrap any type J as long as that type extends the basic job type. And this is great for something like our enqueue job function, right? Because now we can say job.start to actually kick that job off in our queue. Now, if we take a look at our enqueue job function here, we do have a problem. If we hover over the T here, we can see that T does not satisfy the constraint of job. Essentially, we're saying enqueue job accepts some type T, could be any type T though. We're not saying it has to match the job type. 
Well, that's pretty easily solved when we can say that t extends job as well. So now our in queue job function will only accept arguments that have a type that extends the job type. So now if we come down to our in queue job function here, we can see that it does not accept a simple string. That is not good enough because it doesn't have the capabilities of a job. So let's replace it with our send email job j. Unfortunately, that doesn't have what we need as well. We're going to modify the send email job type to say that it is the intersection of the base job and its own custom fields, which is a nice way to do this, I think. And then I'm going to copy the properties that we have on our job here, and we're going to have to add those to the job that we have created down here. Now we can see that this job is successfully being accepted here. Now, the neat thing about this is now that we have some properties on our job that we know will always be there, we could actually use them inside of our in queue job function. So maybe I'll replace this comment here with something like job dot start. Notice that if I do job dot, we get some autocomplete here and we can have the name, the start and the state. The nice thing here is that we have basically anything that is on the job type because we know any argument that we receive here will at least fulfill the requirements of the job type and likely more. But the nice thing is we don't care about what those other things are. Now, this is a little bit different than the way an array or a promise works, right? The array or the promise does not require uh, any certain fields on the types that they accept the way we're doing with the job here. But inside your own application, you can use this technique to create generic wrappers for common sets of types within your own system. I think if you look through some of the code bases that you work in regularly, you'll probably see places where generics can be really handy. Like I said, they're a great way to wrap common functionality around and other types that you use frequently. So play around with it. Let me know if you have any questions about how generic works. I'll be happy to answer those in the comments. If this was helpful, I'd appreciate a like or subscribe. And thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.